Hey everyone, welcome to chapter 5 of Morgan Housel's The Psychology of Money. Chapter 5 is called Getting Wealthy versus Staying Wealthy, um, which reminds me of one of my favourite lines ever about money, which I heard in my 20s, it's not what you get, it's what you keep. So, getting wealthy and staying wealthy are two very different things and they require different skills. And Housel's writing is brilliant. I mean, he starts this chapter by giving us the example of Jesse Livermore, who you've probably heard of. He was the best known stock operator, stock trader of his time. He became a professional investor before, you know, most people knew you could do such a thing. And by the time he was 30, he was worth the inflation adjusted equivalent of a hundred million dollars. So he did really, really well. Um, then he contrasts that with the story of Abraham Jaminski, who was an, an a successful uh, real estate developer in New York, uh, who in his 50s, well, his luck turned. So what do I mean by luck turned? The 1929 stock market crash, Black Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, whatever the days were, when stocks declined 70% from their high. And there were stories of a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, investors committing suicide. Things were really, really bad because in the late 20s, what most successful New Yorkers did was they bet heavily on the stock market. And then when the stock market crashed, well, it ruined a lot of them. So Abraham Jaminski um, probably committed suicide. The last that was seen of him was he was walking towards Broadway with a bit of ticker tape. That's what tells you the price of the stocks, tearing it up, scattering it on the pavement. Um, that's the last we know of him. So probably he took his own life. On the same day, though, Jesse Livermore, um, well, he survived it. And his wife, Dorothy, was at home panicking because there are all these reports of other investors committing suicide you know apparently Jesse came home and uh, his wife was panicking the children were crying his mother-in-law was in another room screaming and he couldn't figure out what was going on and then he figured out that they maybe thought he killed himself as well but what actually happened is he'd been betting the market would go down so in that one day he made the equivalent of three billion dollars today and became one of the richest men on earth so Abraham Jumanski, good at getting rich, good at making money, getting wealthy. Jesse Livermore, incredibly good at getting wealthy. Abraham Jumanski couldn't stay wealthy because he bet all his money on stocks. And eventually, uh, you know, it ruined him. He lost his money and, and he killed himself. Jesse Livermore, what happened to him? Made three billion in uh, 1929, one of the richest men on earth. Four years later, fortunes had turned. He had been betting bigger and bigger and bigger, thinking he was invincible after becoming one of the richest men on earth. Uh, he lost it all as well. And then he eventually killed himself. So both of those guys, extremely good at getting wealthy, very bad at staying wealthy. How many people do you know, probably lots, who make tons of money, or have made tons of money and are now broke? Or if you don't know any, look at so many of these celebrities, all right? Making money is one skill, requires optimism, requires putting yourself out there, requires really going for it in most cases. Staying wealthy, different skill. Um, Morgan Housel calls that a combination of paranoia and frugality and not having the belief that just because today's being good, tomorrow's going to be good as well. So in an interview with um, Michael Moritz, head of Sequoia Capital, Sequoia Capital is a 40 year old head, not hedge fund, sorry, venture capital fund. So uh, uh, Moritz is a billionaire and uh, some guy was interviewing him and he said, what's the secret to your success? And Morris basically says, you know, not believing that just because we've been successful before, we're going to be successful tomorrow. Most venture capital firms, they stick around for five, 10 years. Sequoia has been around for 40 years. And so this goes back to the thing about, um, the thing from the previous chapter about Warren Buffet, doesn't it? Where he's been investing, making about 22% a year from the age of 10 up until the age of at least 89. And the vast, vast, vast majority of his wealth has been made in the last 10 or 15 years of that 79, 80 year run. My God, that's a long time, right? So the trick there is you don't have to make massive returns. You don't have to make tons of money. You just have to make enough and let, and, and survive, stick around long enough so that compounding can work for you. Stick around long enough so that you can accumulate the money. Um, you know, don't blow it all. Don't risk it all on one bet. Don't risk it all on one investment or one idea. So as far as financial planning goes, you need a plan that is still okay, even if it doesn't work that well. So I often talked about this with 
with friends of mine where if your financial plan is like a perfectly fitting tailored suit then all that happens is conditions gain a bit of weight or lose a bit of weight and you're screwed it looks awful it doesn't work whereas if it's like a baggy overalls then you're fine you know you, you it lasts you get through so talking about um warren buffett again one thing that is mentioned in chapter five getting ver uh, wealthy versus staying wealthy you know about warren buffett you probably know about charlie munger his his partner um there was another guy whose name is now escaping me rick delvin maybe something like that rick gerin rick gerin i think it's rick gerin he was a third member of the group, so it wasn't just Buffet and Munger and Gerin. Um, but in the 1970s, there was a recession, and Gerin was in a hurry to get rich. So in an interview with Buffet, somebody asked him about Gerin, and Warren said, me and Charlie, as in Warren Buffet and Charlie Munger, always knew we'd be incredibly wealthy, and we weren't in a hurry, but Gerin was in a hurry. So when the recession came in the 1970s, he, he was way over his head. He was in a rush. He had leveraged bets and everything. So, you know, he was using margin, which means he was borrowing money to invest more. He got margin calls. So he still did well, but compared to Buffet and Munger, he's, he kind of disappeared off the face of the planet. Buffet talks about the fact, quite happily, I imagine, that he bought Gerin's Berkshire Hathaway stock at $40 a share. Um, I'm sure even back in the 70s, it was worth several multiples of that. But Gerin was forced to sell Big C got in over his head. He was in too much of a rush. Greed and haste, maybe, is what ruins the wealthy. Um, you know, or if you think back to the the guy who used to walk around with big wads of cash that um, I mentioned in chapter one, just stupidity. You know, just because you're making a million dollars a week doesn't mean you need to flash it around or, or, or spend it all or even even a hundred dollars you know if you're making a hundred dollars doesn't mean you have to spend a hundred dollars that day no you might not have to spend anything so why would you because let the money grow have the money stick around all right um, so what else was there in this chapter because this was a great chapter by the way pessimism you should always allow for some pessimism but not let it put you off you know have a plan a long-term plan and make sure that whilst you wait for the plan to work you keep your head above water because there's always pessimism so in the last 107 years since I think the book was written 2018 right so in 107 years before 2018 the average the GDP of, of America per head rose 20 times so that means that living standards one could say went up 20 fold in 107 years but in that 107 years there were I think something crazy like 30 30 recessions um four u.s presidents assassinated um 1.3 million americans killed in wars uh 675 million americans killed by flu in one year or something crazy like that um and you know oh and all these all these recessions maybe it was recessions there were a good number of recessions lasting about 40 years so yeah there, there were 30 recessions in 107 years um and none of these recessions by the way not a single one was predicted by analysts and financial forecasters <laughs> that's interesting isn't it how much do they actually know what else was there in that 107 year period that he mentioned God, there, was, there was a lot of bad stuff it didn't look good Everyone thought that there was a 2008 financial crash in which 10 million Americans lost their home. There was the subsequent recession in which 9 million Americans lost their jobs. Um, now there's COVID. All right. So but this book can't be written in 2018 because he mentions COVID in there. So it must have been 2020. He says the COVID pandemic that is currently ravaging the world. So, you know, bad things are going to happen. Um, but it doesn't mean that overall there isn't progress. You look at the Forbes list of richest families and that has per decade a 20% turnover. So people who are richest families in the world, they're not anymore. And that's not due to, you know, the wealth being transferred to another family member or anything like that. They just lose all their money. So getting wealthy is one thing, staying wealthy is another. The best plan, I guess, is to be patient like Buffet. Um, Buffett, Buffet, Warren Buffet, Warren Buffet. And, you know, don't think that just because you had it good yesterday, oh, I've got a ton of money sitting there, let's go and blow it. No, today and the next day and tomorrow might not be so good. 
it seems simple, but it's psychology, isn't it? Psychology is, seems simple, but it's never straightforward because there's so much going on in our heads, especially when it comes to money. Um, takeaways from that chapter, just what I just said. Uh, you know, make the money, hold on to the damn money, let it grow, yeah? Don't, oh, it's coming in, better get it out. No, it's coming in, let's keep it. Let's maybe try and put it towards something that compounds, yeah, and be patient. Because compounding, as we've seen, again, I'll use the example of Warren Buffet, is, you know, 10 years, it's not gonna do much. 20 years, it still won't do much. 50 years, it can be absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Let's say, you know, you're, you're middle-aged already and you haven't got anything that's compounded. We'll start now and then, you know, in 10, 20 years, you'll be better off. And if you don't need to spend it all, then if you give a damn, maybe your children afterwards, they can have it. And if they compound it too, well, then eventually the next few generations of your bloodline have got nothing to worry about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the brain, synaptic connections in the brain. OK, going back to the fact that the. American standard of living has gone up 20 times in 107 years and there have been all these disasters and all these terrible things. You know, September 9-11, um, that wasn't mentioned in there and all the wars and everything. And it's always looked pretty bleak. It's always looked pretty damn bleak, but things have actually improved a lot. So I also use the example of synaptic connections in the brain. So by the time you're 20, you're, you've lost about half of all the synaptic connections in the brain you had when you were two. So that looks like a disaster. If you could see these synaptic connections disappearing, you think, oh my God, what's happening? You know, my child is losing brain connections. Something's wrong, they're getting stupider. But the average 20 year old is, you'd expect, the average 20 year old is a hell of a lot smarter than the average two year old. So what happens? I guess you could call it like natural selection, couldn't you? Things crash, things get destroyed, things disappear. But what remains, is sometimes a lot better um, you know give it time and you'll grow don't just get wealthy stay wealthy all right so I went off for a bit of a, a long one there I try to keep these, uh, the, these videos below 10 minutes but I hope you enjoyed it I hope you got something from it and I'll be posting my summary of chapter 6 shortly